Just about three years ago, a special project was started in the third grade of the Riceville Elementary, the Riceville Community Elementary School. This was started by Mrs. Jane Elliott, our guest today. She is the teacher for this. And this is, was all started because of some of your reactions on the night of Martin Luther King's assassination. Yes, I was frightened and I was disturbed and I was angry and I was appalled that this kind of thing could happen and had happened so often in the lifetime of my students. My nine-year-olds at that time had lived through three assassinations that were important to them. They wouldn't, they didn't identify with the Malcolm X one, but they, three times in their lives, this horror had taken place. And I didn't know what I was going to do about it in the morning, but when a little boy came in and said, uh, Mrs. Elliott, they shot a king last night, why'd they kill that king? I knew I had to do something, and that was the day we began to learn about discrimination by discriminating against a pick group in my classroom. Now, how did you set this up then? We discussed black people and what these children knew about them, which was very little, mm -hmm. because they have had no experiences with black people. Then we, and they, of course, came up with all these things that they knew for sure about black people, that they steal and they loot and they burn and this kind of thing, although they had never known a black person. And then I asked them how they would like to know a little bit more about how it feels to be black. And they thought that would be great. And then they found out when it started that it wasn't great at all. We, dis we uh, split the room according to eye color. The brown-eyed people were on the top and the blue-eyed people were on the bottom for the first day. And we were to reverse the process the next day, but they were not quite sure that it was going to be reversed. And it was frightening. The things that happened were absolutely terrifying to me to think that this is something, the way these children reacted, very secure, very normal, so-called white children in an all-white community could be this upset after one day of this kind of treatment is ample proof that this kind of thing for a whole, like a tenth of our population, cannot be tolerated. Now, how did it actually work, and what sorts of things did you do to separate the group? Well, the brown-eyed children got to go to recess five minutes early. They got to play on all the playground equipment, take out the small playground equipment, the balls and things. They got to go first in the lunch line. They got to uh, use the new library books and go to the library and use the audiovisual aids in the room whenever they wanted to. The blue-eyed children could do none of these things because everybody knows that blue-eyed children don't take care of things. You give a blue-eyed child something nice and he simply wrecks it. He can't be trusted. He isn't trustworthy. He isn't civilized. He doesn't know how to do these things. It isn't his fault. He simply has the wrong color eyes and they have a terrible um, effect on a child's mental and emotional and physical growth. We treated he's just these not children. Capable. Well, he's just not capable. It's not his fault. He's just, uh, it's just the, simply the matter that he has the wrong color eyes. Mm -hmm. And we did this for a whole day. We discriminated against blue eyed children for one day. And the next day, this happened on, this was on a Friday, so that they had the weekend to recover, hopefully. And on Monday, we reversed the thing and uh, discriminated against the brown eyed people. Now, was there any difference in the Monday group when, that you could really observe when the uh, children who had been on the down uh, took over the major the, role? The Monday group was much more tolerant than the brown-eyed children had been. I don't know why. I hope they learned something. I think they did. But it may be that they found out that you could live through it. Mm -hmm. It may be that they had a weekend to get over it. It may be that they learned, and I think they did. Now, did you play the role, or were you completely uh, separate? Oh, no. <laughs> I was blue-eyed. On the first day, I pulled down the map, and it rattled around the thing, and a little girl in the front row said, well, I said, well, see, I've done it again. I did it again. And she said, well, what do you expect? You've got blue eyes, haven't you? And I was, I was just furious inside for a minute. And a little brown-eyed boy, a little blue-eyed boy in the back spoke up and said, oh, Debbie, you know she does that all the time. She never has known how to do that right. And then I kind of was mad at him. <laughs> I didn't know which one I should be more angry at, the child who was discriminating or the child who was accusing me of never having been too bright. <laughs> but, but the second day, the second year we did it, last year when we did it, I told the, we reversed this thing after the, the, at the beginning of the second day. And one little blue-eyed boy, the blue-eyed children were on the top the first day in that, that year. And one little blue-eyed boy, when he found out I was reversing it, he said, you lied to us. And I said, yes, I lied to you. What does that prove to you about blue-eyed people? And he says, you ain't any good. And he was not joking. 
He was, he was absolutely furious. You ain't any good. And he maintained that attitude throughout the day, that I was no good. It was, I said, if I didn't have these blue eyes, I'd be principal in this building. I wouldn't be teaching in the third grade. And one of the kids laughed, and I said, you think that's funny? And one of the little boys spoke up and said, no, Mr. Brownwell's got blue eyes, brown eyes. Mr. Brownwell's got brown eyes. And they just simply took it for granted that his uh, eye color was the reason he was principal. Mm -hmm. Now, you have with you some things that express some of the feelings of the before and after as the children actually depicted it. Yes, the day... We, t we did a picture. Each child drew a picture of himself each day. And this was the way one of them felt on the day when she was wearing... This year they had to wear collars. This was uh -huh. filmed this year for ABC TV. Right. And we had to wear collars so that the, the difference could be seen by, with the camera. And this little girl, when I asked her how, the cam how she felt when she had the collar on, she said it felt like she had a chain around her neck. And whenever she walked, she was dragging that chain behind her. Hmm. Now... Here we have a happy day, don't we? Yes. In the terms of, yes. I'm on top. Mm -hmm. Well, in the terms of, I'm happy again. This was a mm -hmm. terrible experience for these children this year, particularly. Uh, I have three little girls who are absolutely inseparable, best friends. And they were just shattered by this thing. But how many of us are denied the pleasures of being with our best friends when we take our best friends home if they're the wrong color for a weekend? Mm -hmm. this is so that it's, uh, it's not unrelated to the total situation as far as society goes. This was John who felt as though he were tied to a post. He said he couldn't get away. He said he felt like an animal that was tied up when he had the collar on. Mm -hmm. Now, is he the one that took the collar off and then... No, yeah. no. We, I had another little boy who said he felt like he was going to throw up. And I said, why do you suppose that is? And he said, I think it's this collar. It's too tight. And I said, do you really think it's the collar? And he says, well, no, maybe, maybe it's my shirt. And I said, well, why don't you take your collar off and see if that's what it is? So he took his collar off. And I said, now does your shirt feel too tight? And he says, no. And I said, then what do you think it is? And he says, I guess it must be that collar. And I said, well, put the collar back on. And his face just fell. I, he thought when he took it off there, that's over. And I said, put the collar back on. He put it back on. And he said, I said, well, what do you think it was? And I says, I guess it must have been the collar because I feel like I'm going to throw up again. Now, did it bother him when he had the other, co the other color collar on? No, they just wore a collar for the one day, oh, just only on their day of inferiority, so-called. And this is the little boy who, who felt like he was going to throw up when he had the collar on, the little boy who drew this picture. That was his good one? This was his good one, and this was his bad one. Mm -hmm. I asked him what all this was, and he said, well, this is like fire. And I said, what's all this? And he said, well, this is the way I feel like it is all around me today. And he was, he was very, this is the devil <laughs> on his head. He was very, very upset by this. And if, uh, this is the thing that frightens me, if these little children are this upset on a one-day basis, it uh, must be a horrible thing to live through this for a lifetime. Right, and I want to continue talking with you tomorrow about it. Our guest is Mrs. Jane Elliott, third grade teacher in the Riceville Community Elementary School, and tomorrow we'll continue with this. Our guest today, again, is Mrs. Uh, Jane Elliott, third grade teacher in the Riceville Community Elementary School. Yesterday, we were talking about the project that was started about three years ago in the Riceville third grade school. And perhaps before we go on today, you better just real quick like say what we're talking about and then we will uh, go on with some of the children's interpretations because some people may not have seen yesterday's. Well, this was this project that we did called Discrimination Day when we separated the children in the room according to the color of their eyes and then practiced discrimination against the child who was in the inferior, so-called inferior group on each day. One day the brown-eyed children were on top and the next day the blue-eyed children were. And so that they actually, uh, they weren't role-playing. Oh, were no, they weren't pretending because I think role-playing has a very definite place. Mm -hmm. But not when you really want to know how it feels. You can't pretend to a feeling that you've never, ever had. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's important that these children learn to empathize with other people. The Sioux Indians have a prayer that says, Oh, great spirit, keep me from ever judging a man until I have walked a mile in his moccasins. I think it's beautiful. I think if every child could have the experience of walking in the moccasins of a child in a, of a minority group, that perhaps by the time we're grandparents, we might be able to see a difference in, in the kind of thing that's happening now. Mm -hmm. Christian, you never can be exactly in those shoes, but you can, no, but you can get to know the for a minute the horror. Mm -hmm. At least it should prevent them from ever making that child that miserable themselves, which is what I'm trying to do. Right. Now, yesterday we saw some of the, well, the children doing their own pictures of how they felt. And yeah, so let's show another one. Uh, drew his own picture on his day of superiority, so-called, and inferiority. And this is the way this little girl felt on her good day. And this is the way she felt on her bad day. It's, uh, and you see, she drew the collar. This year, they, they wore collars. The child who, the children in the inferior group had to wear collars so that they could be identified readily, so that even when they went on, out to the playground, they had to take the collar off and put it around their arm and pin it on so that you could see from a distance, so that you would run no chance of bumping against this child or playing with this child without realizing that he was one of the untouchables, so mm -hmm. to speak. Now, uh, going on from there, two things have uh, happened. Uh, but first, do you think that this had any long-term effect on the children? Do you think they remember it? Now, oh, this absolutely. has been three years. Yes, I do. Um, in fact, they did interviews. ABC TV did, an inter did interviews with some of these children who had been in my room last year and year before last. Mm -hmm. And without exception, these children said they not only remembered, but they thought that every third grade teacher should be teaching this that every third grader should have to have this experience because they had learned so much from it. During the year, the last year when we did this, we did this early in the year, and it was marvelous, the learning situations that came about as a result of it later on. At Christmas time in our weekly news trails, newspaper that you had in the third grade, there was a question, um, how could we have peace on earth? How can children work for peace on earth? And one little boy, said, I know how we can have peace on Earth, Earth Mrs. Elliot. We can make all the grown-ups go through discrimination days. Then we'll have peace on Earth. And things like this came up throughout the year, things that they would, they would relate, many, many things that happened to them. On the bus, right after we did this film last year, we, this was done, and it was filmed. It was filmed because we were doing it. We mm -hmm. did not do it because anyone was coming to film, obviously. That would, there would be no sense in it that way. But um, after we had done this thing, one of the children, several of the children, children, high school boys, said to my students on the bus, ah, yeah, you're the kids that got that nigger lover for a teacher. And those kids came in that day and they said, look at us. We know more than high school people do. We know that you don't use that word. And we know there's nothing wrong with being that kind of person. We know more than they do. And I was delighted. I thought they, they have learned something. If that's all they've learned, they've learned not to say that to another person. I was, I was uh, totally thrilled by this. And this kind of thing came up throughout the year. Now, of course, you've been filmed this year for the NOW program that is coming up on ABC. Mm -hmm. But it was, again, the same thing. This was, you were doing the project, and you were filmed uh, in the process of the project. We had planned the project for Brotherhood Week, mm -hmm. and ABC contacted us and asked whether they would be allowed, could be allowed to film it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, was, it was done not to be filmed, but it was filmed because it was being done. Now, going on to something else, you have uh, been, of course, with something like this, invited to some adult groups uh, <laughs> to talk about it. I'm sure that that was the intent. I think that adult is kind of a funny word there, because <laughs> we did this with one adult group. We, instead of just telling them what had happened, we discriminated against, we segregated a group and discriminated against the blue-eyed members of the group. And it was a luncheon, and we made the blue-eyed people set up their own tables and get their own trays and the whole bit. And when a blue-eyed, there was one instance, a blue-eyed man was filling his plate and a brown-eyed man, not as well-dressed, and obviously a um, manual laborer, came in. And the blue-eyed, tall, stately man, well-dressed man, was filling his plate. And I said, you'll have to back up and let this brown-eyed man in ahead of you. And he said, lady, what do you think you're doing? And I said, you have blue eyes. It's not my fault. Please get out of the way. And he said, lady, if my potatoes get cold while you're doing this messing around. And I said, don't blame your eye color on me. Talk to your mother and get out of the way, please, so that this superior individual can fill his plate. He was furious. I can't understand why. But he was just, he was just quite angry. And this thing went from bad to worse throughout the luncheon. At one point, they made a great white sign and put we protest on it. At another, when they were supposed to pick up their 
clean off their tables. They picked the tables up and took them over by the cafeteria line. And I said, well, you see, they aren't as civilized as brown-eyed people. And at that point, they got up and walked out. <laughs> and they were, they were only half joking. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, had, they were looking for someone to talk to a group later on in the year. And they, my name was brought up, and 20% of them voted never to have me back, ever, ever. <laughs> it, it, was, it was rather um, non-adult. It was kind of frightening that they felt the pinch in this one hour's time. If they applied what they felt in that one hour's time to how a fifth, a tenth of our population in the United States feels every day, then they learn something, even those grown men learn from a discrimination day exercise. Right, now going back to your uh, students then, and on the days that they were on the down days, were they able to work if, uh, up to their normal efficiency? No, on their down days, this, this was um, one of the real problems, was that they did not do as well on their down days. Absolutely not. In fact, I had three years ago, the first time we did this, I had this one child who had never made a mistake. From the moment she came into my room, she simply did not make mistakes. And on that day, she misspelled words that she should not have misspelled. And she, it was, uh, the proof was perfectly obvious that this has a terrible effect on a child. They believed immediately what the power structure told them they were, and they lived up to their image. Now, did you have any that had ordinarily been sort of quiet uh, children that, that became different sorts of people on their up day? They were practically all of them, with one exception, were vicious. Um, they discriminated mm -hmm. on their up day. Even, even the very, except for, well, there were two who were very secure and didn't feel that it was necessary. They, were, they simply didn't need to discriminate. And we thank you. This has been Mrs. Jane Elliott, third grade teacher in the Riceville Elementary School, the Riceville Community Elementary School, to get the <laughs> yes. entire thing. And uh, the program now will be coming up soon. And that was filmed in your classroom. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to see more about actually how this functions. And they can watch that. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank you very, very much for sharing this with us. Good afternoon. We are again today at the Iowa Sports and Vacation Show. And today we're going to look a little bit at some things from the Eddie Allen Boat Discount. Ed, Ed Allen Boat Company. Boat Company. OK. This is Larry Allen, who is the son of the owner. And we're going to first talk about the Cadu. So why don't you tell us what this vehicle can do? The Cadu is an all-terrain vehicle. It's propelled by a 20-horse Kohler engine, and it'll go on land and water in just about any place you want to take it. On land, it'll run about 30 miles an hour, and the water, 3 miles an hour. It's propelled in the water by the, just the tires, and uh, it's a pretty, pretty much all-around vehicle. It'll go just about anywhere. Is this kind of thing very popular right now? Well, it's picking up. It's just a new thing in the last couple of years. There are a lot of companies started to make them now, and uh, I think they'll go pretty big. What is the advantage of your particular model? Well, our model's a, l a little more deluxe than the other models, but I guess everyone feels like that. We've got the electric starter and the generator, the large battery and uh, lights. And, uh, it's, it's just a little bit better, I think. Okay. How about the Reveler? Is that what you call it? Right, this is the Johnson Reveler. It's a 19-foot. This is basically a ski model here. It's got the 155-horse one, one V6 engine in it, and it's made by OMC, Outboard Marine, who make Johnson Motors. What kind of features does it have? Well, it's got the stern drive, OMC stern drive inboard outboard. With It's got the basic economy of an inboard and the versatility of an outboard, where the out drive is capable of lifting up or putting down, just like a regular outboard motor. That's, that's the main features of the OMC. And the luxury model that you have is the cruiser, so explain a little bit about that. Right, this is our 23-foot cruiser in the back. It's completely self-contained. and. Uh, it's quite a boat. It's got the stand-up head, the stand-up cabin. It'll sleep three or four. It's got a dining table inside. It's got a stove. 
And this particular model has a 210 horse V8 with the OMC stern drive, similar to the Reveler. Now, what other models have a different engine? Well, there's several makes of stern drives. There's the OMC, Merc Cruiser, and Chrysler are the big names, but uh, we handle mostly OMC and Merc Cruiser. How about the motors that you have behind us? What can you tell us about that? These motors back here are fishing motors, basically. They've got the one and a half here, and the th six horse and the four horse. These are our largest selling fishing motors because they're under six horse, which six horse, of course, is the limit on Iowa State Lakes for motors. What about the other motor, then? This is not a fishing motor. No, the 20 horse is used, well, mainly on larger boats as an auxiliary motor or just on small runabouts. So these are a few of the things you can see at Eddie Allen's Boat Company. We've been visiting with Larry Allen. And now I see something over here that we might want to look at, so let's go over there. This is what looks like a Volkswagen. And this is Mr. Roy Snyder from S&D Enterprises in Eames. What's different about this Volkswagen? It is a regular Volkswagen. It is a regular Volkswagen. This is one of Jimmy Nantista's used cars. Uh, they spent about two hours taking the fenders off so that the tires would show better and uh, it'd make a better display model. Actually, it's different in the fact that it has a high flotation traction tires in the rear and the wide rims, of course. And on the front, it has a, a ski attachment, which our company makes. Now, what do you call this contraption? We call it the buggy ski, and it's sold in a rear and a front kit so that if people already have the rear wheels and tires, they can buy just the front set. In other words, they would buy the skis and the and wheels the, and rims. Okay. The tires. Is this something they can install themselves? Yes, it is. It's just like changing a tire, actually. And after the adapter's on the front, they simply remove one bolt and uh, slide the ski off of the adapter so they can drive with the adapters on all year round if they wish. But other than that, it's just a simple process of putting it on and taking it off again when you're... Like changing a spare tire if you have a flat tire. Mm -hmm. What can this machine do? Where can it run? What speeds? This kind of... We've had, uh, we've had inquiries from all over North America, actually. Uh, the oil companies that are uh, exploring in the north, on the North Slope in Alaska and in Canada, the Canadian government has expressed an interest in it. Uh, it's good for a country like that where they, they have a hard time building roads uh, and a hard time getting around. It's, it's warm, of course. You can stay inside the car and travel over the snow. Uh, ranchers and uh, ski resorts, of course. A lot of farmers have asked about it also for going out to feed cattle and check on the cattle and so forth. Does this, the ski itself and the tires, change what the car can do speed-wise or anything? Uh, speed-wise, no. With a standard Volkswagen, they couldn't expect to go more than about 45, I suppose, in uh, snow. It depends, again, on the snow conditions. If they have a hard-crusted snow, I don't know that there would be a limit. But with real soft, gooey snow like we've tested in, the most they could expect it to be about 40 or 45 miles an hour with the skis on. If they take the skis off, of course, then you get into steering problems and you start bogging down the snow. So actually, under those conditions, it does improve the speed, but comparing it to highway conditions, it slows them down. Is there any way that the performance can be improved as you apply these things? Oh, yes. They can, uh, for instance, for the performance-minded man, he can take the front wheels off, mount the adapters right on the brake drum, which is just the five bolts. Uh, it's a very quick method of doing it. That way he can eliminate the weight of the, both the front wheels and tires, and he can also take out the spare tire and the equipment out of the trunk. And if they're going to use this a lot in the snow, for instance for an entire week or something, there are just a, a few bolts holding the front fenders on and the front bumper, and there's no reason to have them on there while the skis are on unless they're going to be running on the road. So that, would, again, would improve the, inform the performance of the machine. And, of course, they can uh, buy performance engines from many different places. Uh, many hot rod shops carry uh, performance engines for Volkswagens. Is your company the only one that designs such a thing? As far as we know, the patent searches have turned up no one else. Uh, there was a company, I think, in Indiana that had skis, but they weren't a quick mount ski. They hooked on with chains and so forth. Can this kind of a device be attached to other cars, or is it just the Volkswagen? 
right now we only have the Volkswagen skis uh, in tooling. However, uh, by this summer we will be we will be designing the the adapters to fit the Corvairs and Renaults also. How much does this kind of a thing run? The entire setup for the uh, the Goodyear tires, the wide rims from California, and the skis and adapters and all the attaching bolts uh, run $520. So this is one other thing that you might see when you come to the Iowa Sports and Vacation Show. And now let's look at some of the other exhibits. 